Hey, hey, Blue Table fans! Yeah! Double demon fire of happiness! That's your enthusiasm level for the day. And guys, it comes from the heart. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I got this picture from my mom, and she... It was of me and my high school buds, and we're about 16 years old, I guess. And to see this picture, you'll have to be my Facebook friend, because I'm not editing this video to include it. And you can be my Facebook friend. Uh, uh, my name is Sean Gately. Yeah. Alright, so I always think of things I want to put in these videos, and then I forget about them, and don't write them down, and... Here I am doing this. You may see a reflection in my eyeglasses of a Christmas tree. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we went to go buy a fake one. And the old one was like 15 years old. It's, it had finally just given up. And we went to go buy another fake one. And my daughter my four-year-old daughter, she insisted on getting a white one. So we got a white one and a green one. And they were both like super inexpensive. I was actually super surprised at how not expensive these were. And I come from Southern Oregon and uh, hold on, I'm getting a text from an artist. Okay, good. One more hour. Perfect. Alright. And I come from the backwoods of Oregon and you know what you do there, you go and actually get a Christmas tree, you get like a permit. I think we were like hillbillies, we just went out and just did it. Uh, pretty sure. Uh, don't, quote, don't quote me on that. Anyway, we always had a real one. And even when I was young and married in like circa 1996, we still went out and got a real Christmas tree. And never again, because that's a pain. Oh my gosh, no thanks. And so we've had a lot of fun. My little daughter decorating her uh, her white Christmas tree. It's uh, about six feet tall. I'm looking at it right now. Um, all right, again, and you, you can see pictures. If only you're my Facebook friend. Wait a minute. Oh, no, I didn't bring my water. Oh, no, there it is. Good. <coughs> Excuse me. I was eating, I was eating a bunch of peanuts. Peanuts. All right. So, what's going on? First off, I'm a little embarrassed to make a face-to-face -face video after a long time. And I know you guys miss the crew and miss the studio and everything. I get it. And I get people, they wander in sometimes, they're like, hey, what happened to your giant operation? And I'm like, awesome. I never get tired of answering this question. Long story short, it was fun while it lasted, but it was a lot of stress, and so now I have gone down from here to here. And this is like, this is so, guys, I can't ever go back now, because it's so low stress. I do whatever I want, and I don't have to flail my arms, I don't have to worry about anything. Everything just naturally flows in, and that makes Sean happy. Happy inside his dark, evil little heart. All right, what else? Uh, Pathfinder. And I won't tell, usually I'm like, let's start at the beginning of first edition Dungeons and Dragons. So Pathfinder is a version of Dungeons and Dragons. The first version of Pathfinder came out in 2008. I loved it. I've played it for a long time. And now they came out with second edition. And I just wrapped up my Pathfinder 1 campaign like a month and a half ago, two months, two, two months ago, yeah, 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 and uh, no, wait a minute, uh, and it was like mid, mid October, November, December. yeah, exactly two months ago, so uh, that was a lot of fun, so I have basically a stack eight feet tall of Pathfinder 1 books at modules, tons of, there was a point years ago where I was like, I'm gonna get one of everything they make for this system, it's so great, I absolutely love it, and now, uh, and now I, I don't know what will happen. 
Uh, one thing that I follow is secondhand Dungeons and Dragons stuff, and I'm very interested in that. Like a player's handbook from 1981, how much is that going for? And there's a guy that has, what's his website, the As As Asinium or something like that? And I'm looking at his prices and I'm like, yeah, you let me know where you can get those prices for these books. Because they're actually going for like, uh, like the old rule books are at least 50. Uh, and there you go. So anyway, love that old stuff. I'm not getting into it as like a, like a dealer or anything like that. I have a few on my web store, but it's going to take a while for reality to catch up to where I have them priced, which is like up here. And uh, what else? Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm waiting around for that value to go, because it will go up. In 20 years, those books will be super rare, really hard certainly to find them in good condition. And uh, now, Wizards of the Coast, who has bought Dungeons and Dragons, and they've been doing, they've been doing a good job with it. It does have sort of that big corporation feel to it now, which is both positive and negative. Back in the day, in like the 80s and 90s, uh, the parent company of, T of uh, Dungeons and Dragons, TSR, you know, they had a rocky road, and, and it's rocky when you're a small company, there's lots of things that can happen. Uh, so, but with Wizards of the Coast, it sort of brought them into this more stable umbrella, which is nice to see, and they've really done justice to, I think, uh, both the spirit and the mechanics of the spirit of the game, and also the mechanics of actually making a game... Uh, more popular and entering it into the mainstream. And of course that's what's driving all this nostalgia is, oh now everybody's into Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, so, <clears throat> oh yeah, 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 I'm going to talk quite a bit more about this actually. Um, but just a brief intermission on that, uh, I want to talk about my trade program. So if you have a bunch of stuff, it could be uh, role-playing books, uh, mostly it's miniatures, and then you want some work done, like to get an army painted, boy, let me know, because I have some great deals. Let's say you had an army with a hundred figures in it. Usually, the co don't quote me on this, because quotes always have to go by email. Uh, usually it's $10 per figure, sometimes more if it's like more complicated infantry. So uh, let's just say to get an army done is $10 a figure times a hundred figures is $1,000. $1,000? <gasps> That's the rent money. Well, a couple things you can do. First off, uh, you can get, I have a program called Just Get It Done, which is like the $5 haircut of paint jobs, and you'd be surprised. They turn out pretty good. And that's half off! Ah! But I have one of my newer painters sort of cut their teeth on a whole army, and, uh, and by the way, the painters I bring on, they're already good. And I train them up on uh, studio materials, so they're definitely up to par before the models get, before your models get touched. But not with this program. But it does have the advantage it knocks down to 500. And then you can do a trade-in and knock it down to get like a $250 credit for your stuff. I'm just throwing numbers around here. And now you just pay $250. And, quite frankly, if you can play miniatures battles at all, you can definitely have your army painted by us. And we do all sorts of work, from 500 goblins painted the most basic possible, all the way up to boutique-level painting. However, our real specialty, our strength, is that workhorse project. So, there's that. Back to role-playing games. So Pathfinder 2nd Ed is out, and I was like, yeah, it's great, but I don't know. I was looking at 5th edition. Oh, that's good. And so I was going to go to 5th edition, and of course I just wrapped up my campaign. So here I am with my group, and I got my dream group. For a long while, I was like, you know what? I want a group that will show up every week. Hell or high water, like they're into it. This is the most important thing in their lives. And I want six players. And, and I got it. I got this amazing group. 
They're absolutely fantastic. So we sat down and we we're like, what are we going to play next? And so we fielded all these different things. We were looking at Vampire the Masquerade. Uh, we were looking at uh, Fifth Edition. We were looking at, oh, I can't remember, some other things. And in the end, they were like, well, Sean, why don't you just do what you're inspired to do? So uh, that's where, I don't know if I told you guys about this, but I have this uh, sealed bin full of stuff I wrote in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. And it's like, it's like a huge stack and thick too. It's typewritten, it's, it's handwritten, single space, and just like notes and notes and whole adventures that I wrote, maybe 10 adventures. And I'm like, awesome. You know, if I could go back in time, I should have started my own publishing company and, and I could have done it because to publish something, you just got to go to the copy shop and make 10 copies or 50 copies and, and get in co and copyright it. That would have been awesome. Uh, but I'm 51 now, not too late to start. So I've started writing my own rule book for a D20 system uh, game. And I know everybody's doing that. You know, you go to the game shop, you see that pathetic little Kickstarter effort where just the one core book came out to it, or maybe they managed three books. And by the way, Super high fives, man, because that's amazing. It is a huge effort to get a book published, and it ain't cheap either to do it. There's, there's, an inv there's so many investments. And the art, oh man. Uh, and by the way, I'll be looking for artists too. So I am admitting the truth. It's a vanity project. I'm doing it for nostalgia, and I'm doing it for my kids too. So uh, if something comes of it, that would be really cool. But it's high time that Sean Gately got some intellectual property under his belt. And I've already started. So in the last 30 days, I've written 47,000 words. I've written a lot. And a lot of it is drawn and collated from this other material. I'm probably only like 5 to 7% the way through uh, the actual stack of stuff that I have. So a lot of it is... A lot of it is uh, new. Well, I don't know. Where are those percentages really? Well, uh, yeah, actually a much higher percentage is based on older stuff. So, uh, I'm excited about that. And I'm going to alpha test it with my own group. And sometime in the spring, I'll be ready to beta test it with groups. I'll be looking for four to six groups that I can give this rule book to. And run a game in my setting. Why not? And uh, what else? Oh, and I'm super stoked for it. Uh, but art, you need a lot of art to do a rule book. And, and I'm definitely seeing the difference between, like, Steve Jackson games. They always had a color cover, but ev all the illustrations were black and white. And looking at them now, I'm like, yeah, they were probably uh, pretty simple. And that's economical. Um, and Steve Jackson games, uh, who I love, by the way, uh, GURPS, Generic Universal Role Playing System, uh, I look at their stuff now, and I'm like, oh, this is just like, like this takes less effort than a, a White Dwarf magazine to actually do this. And, um, and I'm not disparaging at all. I'm just, I'm just looking at these things now with a fresh eye that I'm like, what does it really, what does it really take? So my objective is to have something of the same production value and quality as the 5th edition Player's Handbook for my game. And that means a lot of really amazing art. And that art, it taint cheap. So I, uh, uh, yeah. So next year I'll be looking for artists for that. And obviously I have my main thing going. I'm, I'm definitely not uh, uh, cutting into blue table painting time and effort and focus because all those projects are, are getting moved forward. Uh, and like I mentioned before, I have about I have about 50 projects going at any at any given time. My mason jar. Oh man, if you knew my life. All right. And so I have an awesome setting. I'm very excited, and it's just it just pours out of me. It's just this wonderful feeling of like of creation to uh, be writing this rule book. I'm about for the player's handbook. Uh, okay, so 47,000 words. A novel is typically between 90 and 140,000 words. 
Uh, I think uh, I think Harry Potter is like the first book is like eighty thousand words. So it's I mean. It occurred to me, one morning I was just like scrolling through Facebook and I realized I'd been scrolling for, through Facebook for two hours. And I was like, what can I be doing with this time? And, and granted, it was like super early in the morning and I just couldn't get back to sleep. So, you know, that decision you make, do I just, do I just knuckle down and just get up and get going with my day? Or do I hope that I get sleepy again and get, because if you get up and start doing things, then, then you'll really not get back to sleep. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, so I was like, well, you know what, if, if I wrote a page a day, I would have 365 pages by the end of the year. And sure enough, uh, I, I started in on it, and I'm doing a lot more than that. In 30 days, uh, so what happens is dense text in a rule book, like the old 80s player's handbook, if you look, Gary Gygax, man, he wrote a lot. That guy, and he was right, he was in the 80s like just typing it up on a typewriter. It was crazy. And so he, um, that's about a thousand words per page. That's dense. The modern player's handbook uh, for fifth edition has by my estimate about 500 to 600 uh, words per page. And then of course a lot of art to fill it up and they, they make the font slightly bigger. Of course those are all just choices that they they made. And the player's handbook is, I think, oh, geez, I can't remember. I think it's like 350 pages long, something like that. that so it's, it's, the player's handbook is much longer word-wise than a novel is. And so what do I have? I have about, uh, four, I have 47 dense pages, or maybe we're talking like 70 pages. So I'm about a fourth the way there to have a proper player's handbook. And, uh, of course, you don't want to just write things to write them. It's the spells. The 5th edition player's handbook has, like, a zillion spells in it. And, um, well, to be precise, it has 77 pages of spells with about uh, four spells per page. And some of them have quite a bit of text to them. And... So that's, uh, what, like 300, 300 spells. And in my system, I think I've written like 45. So I got a, I got a ways to go just with the spells. So that's, uh, what, 45 pages dense is uh, what your spells are. So I'm, I'm a ways off with the spell. I got to write up a lot. And I have them already. I just I literally have to transcribe them and convert them into this system that I've made. So I'm, I'm super excited about my system. Uh, it's a six-action economy. And, of course, I've been around miniatures battles and war games and role-playing games my whole life. And I've been, I've been making, like, mental notes and observations as I'm going along. And the problem is that uh, they, they sort of grow out and they get tangled, like, a, like an old-world city. There was never any city planning. You see these old cities that have that are like this spider web, basically. And then you look at, for example, Salt Lake that has like massive lanes and this huge grid for like 20 miles. And that's city planning. So the action economy uh, yeah, of basically you have one thing to do every round. And then they were like, well, now you have a move action and a standard action. And then they were like, oh, but some actions are free actions. Now in fifth edition, you got bonus actions, free actions, Pathfinder, is it in, like, standard action, move action, free action, uh, what is it, swift action, and something else. So, I'm like, well, you know, the real thing is they never granulated this economy. So I granulated it down to six actions, which actually works, works really well. And uh, so, long story short, I'm just writing something that I think is great. I'm, de I'm really writing it just for my own, for my own group. But if something happened, that would be really interesting. And uh, so anyway, uh, Guy, what else? Yeah, there's that. All right, uh, what else? Um, my son is, uh, Jonah is 19. He's, pa he's painting a Necrons army. And we plan on getting some very simple battle reports going. Um, 
and uh, oh, and his dark angels are going really well as well. And uh, for me, 40k, like I've already done it. I'm uh, this is to be the ninth. I started in '97 when they were just coming out of Rogue Trader, which was first edition, which is really a lot more like a role playing game with miniatures as an afterthought. Oh yeah, and getting back to my thing is it's it's a miniatures battles game and it's very delineated where there's points for things and everything's very clear and I'm going to make an attempt to balance it. Of course, the more things you add to something, the more chances that things are just going to fly off the rails because when it comes down to it, if you get a thousand nerds playing your game and one thing is slightly better than the other one, this thing blows up and goes away and is never used and this thing is always used. And so you just, to get that balance, and you have to have that granularity too, which is something that 40K has uh, struggled, not struggled with, but they've definitely had to come to terms with it. <clears throat> like I think around 5th uh, edition, they started making things cost more points so they could chop down the different point levels. But like, imagine if a regular Space Marine were 500 points just for the one model. Um, and then and games were pay, played at, let's say, 100,000 points. So um, you have granularity. You can make something like slightly less powerful or slightly more powerful. And that's, def that, that's a game design thing, like how gra granular do you want it? And of course, with uh, 8th edition and 9th edition, and by the way, I love the changes that they brought to 40K. Uh, my only objection is rules churn. Uh, a term I came across recently, where they're basically changing up the rules so often that you never have a chance to, like, stick. And it's incongruous with the actual physical aspect of the game. Like, you got to buy these models, they're not cheap, and then put them together, that's a lot of labor, paint them, even more labor, and, th and then paint a whole collection, a massive amount of labor, where well, you can't just change the rules all the time for that for people that are into that game. They make a massive investment on it. And, uh, and I see it with commission painting too, that if it takes two months uh, or three months to finish an army, well, in that time, some of the things could have changed. And of course, what's the solution? Magnetization. And uh, that, because they, they don't change the kits, so they have to write rules for the kits, which is something that I do tip my hat to Games Workshop about that. But anyway, in the role-playing game rulebook that I'm writing, uh, it is, there's a distinct shift. There's a time when you're playing the game and you're just role-playing, and there's a time when it is a miniatures battles game, and the, the GM will say, all right, we're going into combat mode, here's the thing, and he actually sets it up more like a war game, like here's where your guys are deploying, or, and there could be storytelling elements to it, of course. Uh, but generally, it turns into basically a miniatures battles game. And, uh, and so I've asked my players, I'm like, break it. Take this rule book, make the most broken character you can. Let's find it out, and then let's start tweaking those points to make it so that it makes sense. And uh, so there you go. Also... All right, so I finished talking about that, finished talking about 40K. Do I want to do a 40K army? Do I want to do an Age of Sigmar army? Yes, I do, because those models are amazing. But for me, in the end, it's a role-playing is where it's at, because you can pick any models you want, you make up your own rules, and of course that speaks to just open play or narrative play. Uh, which is exactly what we're going to do with 40k. Me and my son, we're just going to get some stuff out and, and go for it. All right, you've watched this long. This is going to be a lot. It's going to take so long to upload. Uh, all right, uh, by the way, I got in on trade those Dreamforge Titans. I still have those. Did I mention this earlier? Uh, yeah, with the fixings, I did mention it earlier. All right, guys, uh, what else? Oh, I've been uh, YouTube. What a wonderful thing. We were. Um, I was watching Laverne and Shirley. Remember that show from like the late 70s, early 80s? Man, that was... Watching it now is a mind trip. I mean, not just the nostalgia, but I'm like, you know what? Every generation 
has to come to grips with how the world is and make changes and figure out the rules. And, uh, and I think uh, television, of course, is social engineering or, uh, or if you look at it the other way, it's just social expression of what's happening and again asking those questions sort of coming to terms. Okay, so that's that's kind of a cool thing that I've been doing. I'm watching The Mandalorian. Ah, so awesome, oh my god. Uh, yeah, The Mandalorian total runtime for 15 episodes is creeping up on the total runtime of the nine base movies in the three trilogies. Bah! So and the production, there's nothing wrong with the production value. It's really great. Uh, the other thing is, for while I'm getting my rule book together for my group to actually start my new campaign, uh, which will be, which will take me probably a month or two. We are playing Tales, Tales from the Loop, which is a, a Stranger Thing alternate sci-fi '80s retro role-playing game where you play kids age 10 to 15. And boy, do I have some mind job stuff going on for that. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. We did our first session. We made our characters and, uh, and having a blast with it already. It's really amazing. All right. Well, guys, uh, that is all I got to say. So thanks for tuning in.